This is part two of the lecture on imaging of cystic neck masses. We've talked about the more common congenital cystic neck masses. Now let's move to the less common lesions. We'll start with dermoid tumors. Unfortunately, the word dermoid is an imprecise term. We use it for things like teratomas within the ovary, where it's really just the wrong word. It has been historically said that the term dermoid implies that the lesion arose from two distinct germ cell layers in the fetus, but we know that that's not actually correct. And there's an excellent article by Dr. Smyrniotopoulos in Radiographics if you'd like to learn more about uh, the origins of these germ cell tumors. Dermoid tumors, the characteristic finding is low density. These lesions contain fat. If it contains enough fat that the density drops below zero Hounsfield units, then you can be very specific about your diagnosis. Unfortunately, many dermoids don't have enough fat to overcome the other uh, debris elements within the cyst, and so they don't drop that low, even though they do have some fat. Dermoid tumors are midline, much like thyroglossal duct cysts, but they are more superficial. Remember how important it was when we were talking about the strap muscles surrounding thyroglossal duct cysts. That's how you distinguish them from dermoid tumors. Dermoid tumors are more superficial. They're not embedded in the strap muscles. Here's an example of a dermoid tumor. And you can see it's at the level of the hyoid bone in the anterior neck, just off midline, pretty close to midline. Look how low density it is, right? There's fat inside this lesion. Also, look how superficial it is. These are not the strap muscles. These are the anterior bellies of the digastric, right? We're, we're just above the level of the hyoid bone. Strap muscles don't start until lower down. So we are more superficial than a thyroglossal duct cyst would be. That's how we know it's not that. That and the fat. Thyroglossal duct cysts don't have fat in them, um, but dermoid tumors do, and they often have a small plug of tissue in the center of the dermoid cyst. Notice that the wall is a little more pronounced in a dermoid than it is in, say, a branchial cleft cyst or a lymphatic malformation. Next is thymic cysts. The thymus derives from the third branchial arch, not cleft arch. It migrates down through the neck during fetal life. And as it does so, it is in close association with the thyroid gland as well as the inferior parathyroid glands. Thus, when a thymic cyst forms, it is elongated vertically along the tract that the thymus takes as it migrates down through the neck. That vertical elongation of the cyst, these are tall, thin, hot dog shaped objects. That vertical elongation is what clues us in to the specific diagnosis of thymic cyst. So here's an example of a cystic mass on T2 weighted images deep to the sternocleidomastoid at about the level of the larynx. Is there anything that distinguishes this from the third branchial cleft cyst that I showed you earlier? Nothing. There's nothing that distinguishes it on this image. But let's look at this same lesion in the coronal plane. Now you really get a sense for how elongated and thin this septated lesion is. That's our clue that we're dealing with a thymic cyst. When I see an elongated cystic neck deep to the sternocleidomastoid muscle, cystic mass deep to the sternocleidomastoid muscle, that's when I invoke thymic cyst. Foregut duplication cysts. What is a foregut duplication cyst? Well, it is a type of choristoma. What that means is that it is histologically normal tissue in an aberrant location. There are three different types of foregut duplication cysts, and we can distinguish them based on their locations. Bronchogenic duplication cysts occur in characteristic locations within the mediastinum. Esophageal duplication cysts are really duplications of the esophagus itself and lie alongside the esophagus. Neuroenteric duplication cysts occur in the posterior mediastinum adjacent to the spinal column. Here is a bronchogenic duplication cyst. 
in its second most common location. The most common location is uh, subcarinal, but that's not any good in the neck lecture, so I'm going to show you the second most common location so I feel like it fits into this lecture. A uh, bronchogenic duplication cyst occurs adjacent to the trachea in the superior mediastinum just below the sternal notch. This is still the manubrium of the sternum. Notice that this lesion has no discernible wall, right? A, a lesion without discernible wall that is cystic in this location is most likely going to be a bronchogenic duplication cyst. Foregut duplication cysts are famous for being in the differential diagnosis of cystic masses in the anterior tongue, right, along with dermoids and lymphatic malformations. Uh, so this is a characteristic location for a foregut duplication cyst. Notice that we're not in the posterior tongue where a, a, a thyroglossal duct cyst might be. We are in the anterior tongue, different differential diagnosis. Here is a list of the cystic neck masses that I consider developmental. A plunging ranula, a torn malt cyst, and a vollecular cyst. Let's run through them. A ranula is replacement of the sublingual gland by a dilated duct and atrophy of the gland. It comes in two different forms. A simple ranula, which stays within the floor of mouth, and a plunging, aka diving ranula, which extends from the floor of mouth down into the submandibular triangle in the upper neck. Here's an example of a simple ranula. This cystic lesion is in exactly the location you'd expect the sublingual gland to be. It is along the lingual surface of the mandible, right, elongated along that, right where the gland ought to be. And it is replacing the normal tissue of the gland itself. This is a simple ranula. It exists only in the floor of mouth. You can see that it is obstructing Wharton's duct a little bit there as well. Here's an example of a plunging ranula. The majority of this cystic mass is in the neck, right? Here it is next to the submandibular gland, pushing the submandibular gland out laterally. It's in the submandibular triangle. But look, there's a little tail of communication extending into the floor of mouth, extending to right where you'd expect that subman sublingual gland to be, right? So it is replacing the sublingual gland but then it's also coming out either around the posterior free edge of the mylohyoid muscle or through the buttonier deformity of the mylohyoid muscle down into the submandibular triangle, a plunging ranula. A Tornwald cyst is an embryologic remnant that occurs at one end of Rathke's cleft. It appears as a rounded cystic mass in the nasopharynx it is perfectly in the midline, and it is snuggled up to the highest point in the nasopharynx, right where you'd expect to see the fossa navicularis arising in the skull base. The torn wall cyst is of no clinical consequence. It occasionally will rupture, causing halitosis, but it's of no serious clinical consequence, except that it might be mistaken for something more concerning, like a nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So don't uh, make the mistake of calling that a nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that mucosal retention cysts can occur on any mucosal surface, including the mucus that's right here in the midline of the nasopharynx. How do I know? That's not a mucus retention cyst that happens to be right smack in the midline. I suppose I don't, and I suppose that on occasion I end up calling a perfectly midline mucus retention cyst a Tornwald cyst. I can live with that given the clinical importance of these two diagnoses. A vollecular cyst is a mucus retention cyst that happens to arise within the vollecula. When it occurs in this location, we give it a special name, the vollecular cyst. These tend to be very evident clinically, so they don't cause a lot of confusion clinically, but they can cause confusion radiologically. 
All right, here is the epiglottis, here is the base of tongue, and here is the hyoepiglottic ligament that tethers the epiglottis to the base of tongue and divides the vollecula into two halves. You can see this half is almost completely filled by a uniform density cystic mass. It's a cyst in the vollecula. It's almost certainly just a vollecular cyst. These are also benign. Let's talk now about lymph nodes. Usually, lymph nodes are solid, but not always. Sometimes a lymph node will turn entirely cystic and we have a different differential diagnosis when we see cystic lymph nodes. The most common cause of a cystic lymph node is going to be metastases. Classically, we talk about papillary thyroid carcinoma producing thin-walled or, wall, or imperceptibly walled cystic lymph nodes in the neck. But with the rise of HPV-associated squamous cell carcinoma, there's a new player in this field, and HPV-associated lymph node metastases can also be completely cystic with no perceptible wall around them. So now we've got two players in the metastasis field. Lymphoma tends to be a solid lymph node. But once lymphoma is treated, then they may become completely cystic. The third item that can cause cystic lymph nodes is scrofula. This is uh, tuberculous adenitis. A, a tuberculous adenitis in the neck is referred to as scrofula, so TB. Here's a lymph node that is clearly abnormal. It's enlarged, it's got a thick rim, and it has a necrotic center to it, a classic appearance for squamous cell carcinoma in the neck. I don't know whether you want to call this a cystic lymph node given the thickness of this rind of tissue around it, but um, certainly recognizing this as a necrotic node and thus representative of malignancy is important. You can even see that it has lost its surrounding fat boundaries, indicating extracapsular spread of this node. Here's a lesion that has a thin, imperceptible wall around the majority of the lymph node, but there is mural nodularity along another surface. This is a classic appearance for metastasis from papillary thyroid carcinoma. Sometimes you'll even get some fine speckled calcification uh, in the nodule, in the mural nodule around the edge, but this thin or imperceptible rim is characteristic of this disease. Sometimes you don't get that mural nodule as a clue. Sometimes the node is completely cystic. This is just a crushed jugular vein to the edge here. That's not a mural nodule. So this is a completely cystic lymph node, and it turns out to be papillary thyroid carcinoma. Here's an example of a cystic lymph node, but you can see that there is a thick enhancing rim around the outside and there's infiltration of the surrounding soft tissues. This is characteristic appearance for tuberculous adenitis, scrofula. This patient happens to have HIV, which predisposed to the scrofula. If you can see this enhancement surrounding Cellulitis is particularly if it extends to the skin surface, that's almost always tuberculous disease, either mycobacterium tuberculosum or an atypical mycobacterial infection. In children, atypical mycobacterial infections are pretty common, and nodes like this one are characteristic where you can see some surrounding inflammation, um, particularly facial nodes, which are unusual to be involved by squamous cell carcinoma unless it came from the scalp. Uh, and particularly if you're dealing with a pediatric patient, you should consider um, atypical mycobacterial infections for facial lymph nodes if they are cystic in the center. Okay, time for a pop quiz. What's this cystic lesion in the neck? Well, it's a thin-walled, almost entirely cystic, a little septation, almost entirely cystic mass. It's anteromedial to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. It's at the level of the hyoid bone. This has to be a second branchial cleft cyst. The key here is that this is a 44-year-old man. When you see something that looks like a branchial cleft cyst in an adult, 
don't fall for it. It's not a branchial cleft cyst. This is HPV-associated squamous cell carcinoma from the oropharynx, which can produce entirely cystic nodes, right? Don't call this a branchial cleft cyst. That's cancer because it is arising in an adult, all right? I don't know if I've really uh, uh, beat this point in enough, so I'm going to say it yet again. In an adult, it's not a branchial cleft cyst. It's squamous cell carcinoma. I see this error a lot. Don't do this. Time for the famous other category. We'll talk about laryngoceles, enlarged thoracic duct, glandular cysts in generally, focusing on the parathyroid gland, and some postoperative causes of cystic masses in the neck. What's a laryngocele? To understand a laryngocele, you need to be reminded of the normal anatomy of the larynx. There are in the larynx two false vocal cords composed of fat and below them two true vocal cords composed of muscle. The potential space between the false and true cords is called the laryngeal ventricle. Now, the laryngeal ventricle has a little pocket along its lateral margin called the saccule of the ventricle. If the saccule becomes obstructed, it will enlarge. If there's a ball valve effect, it may uh, fill with gas. If it is more obstructed, it may fill with mucus. And we refer to these generally as laryngoceles. Some people like to reserve the term saccular cyst if it's filled with mucus um, and laryngocele only for air filled, but I think most authors will use the term laryngocele to refer to both of those entities. So what we're looking for is a cystic mass along the side of the larynx. Now these come in three different forms. You can have an entirely intrinsic laryngocele if it stays within the cartilaginous boundaries of the larynx. You can have an extrinsic laryngocele if it's almost all outside and there's just a tiny communication to where the saccule is supposed to be. Or you can have a mixed laryngocele where there are external and internal components of the lesion. I would refer to this as an intrinsic laryngocele because it's pretty much respecting the thyrohyoid ligament there. Sometimes these can become very large. These are bilateral laryngoceles, and you can imagine that this patient had quite a difficult time breathing through that tiny little hole. But he was still breathing through that. There's no trach in this patient. Uh, he's breathing through that tiny little hole. He says he runs into trouble when he mows the lawn. It gives him shortness of breath. Yeah, I'd imagine so. Here's an example of a laryngoceal filled with gas. Small laryngoceles are very common in the larynx. And remember that the saccule is allowed to be a couple millimeters in its own right. So wait until these get to be about a centimeter before you get excited about them. How excited should you get? Should you write off a uh, gas-filled laryngoceal? No big deal, move on to the next patient? No. There are some people in whom a laryngoceal is expected. Patients who have had prior surgery to the larynx, patients who have received irradiation to the neck, um, the inflammation that occurs uh, from those events can close off the saccule or close off the ventricle, and that's a pretty good explanation for a laryngoceal. However, if you have a patient without that kind of history and with no history of a low brass uh, instruments, then you have to worry about these because another cause of laryngocele is a small tumor obstructing the ventricle or obstructing the saccule. It may be too small for you to see radiologically. So when I see a laryngocele and I do not have a, an explanation in the patient's history, I recommend endoscopic evaluation of the larynx to exclude that tiny cancer. Here's a normal structure that I frequently see confused with a cystic lymph node in level four of the left neck. The thoracic duct runs up from the abdomen through the chest, and it's running up the right side of the chest, and then around the level of T4, it swoops over to the left side, runs up through the left tracheoesophageal groove, and then arcs up and over to conclude its course in the notch between the internal jugular vein and the 
subcla subclavian vein in the left neck. As it's terminating there between the internal jugular and subclavian veins, it sometimes becomes dilated, particularly in older adults. This is a normal distal thoracic duct. You can recognize it having a round or elongated form in the upper neck. It turns out that if you look for this, you can see it in about half of neck CTs. So go ahead and look for it and get used to the normal appearance of the distal thoracic duct. Sometimes there's even reflux of venous contrast back up into this, and that can be even more confusing. But it's characteristic location and your ability to follow it back towards the tracheoesophageal groove or would give away the actual diagnosis here. This is a benign entity and the only danger is a radiologist mistaking it for something else. There are a variety of different glandular cysts. In particular, it's worth talking about parathyroid cysts. The reason that it's good to talk about them is that they, become, they, be, they arise in a particularly predictable location along the posterior surface of the thyroid gland and because it's essentially impossible to distinguish a parathyroid cyst from a parathyroid adenoma or even a parathyroid carcinoma, which are thankfully rare. So uh, you need to know more about the patient's history and their endocrine status to distinguish a, a cyst from an adenoma. Ultrasound, of course, helps a lot in that distinction. There are a couple of different cystic neck masses that can arise in the postoperative neck. Almost everyone who has surgery on their neck ends up with a seroma following surgery, but those seromas resolve in about two weeks. Sometimes they become encapsulated and can persist indefinitely, um, and so a persistent seroma is one cause of a postoperative cystic neck mass. However, when you see a postoperative cystic neck mass in the lower left neck, you need to consider one other alternative, and that alternative is a chyloma. A chyloma occurs when the distal thoracic duct is inadvertently injured during surgery. It is very difficult for the body to heal the distal thoracic duct, and so a collection of chyle forms in that location. Uh, putting a needle in this and extracting the material is usually diagnostic because it comes out as whitish chyle rather than serosanguinous material. Now, you might think that a chyloma has to be restricted to the left neck because that's what the thoracic duct is but it turns out they're actually more common on the right. And here's why. About 15% of people have a right-sided thoracic duct. It's, it's actually bilateral and 15% of people. Surgeons know to look out for the thoracic duct on the left, but they're not as cautious on the right. And so you are more likely to get injured on the right if you're one of those 15% of the people than you are on the left for the other 85%. So chylomas can occur on both sides of the inferior neck. Let's take a moment to go over an important differential diagnosis, the cystic mass in the anterior tongue. There are three diagnoses that you should consider when you encounter a cystic mass in the anterior tongue. Almost exclusively, this is going to happen in children. The first is a lymphatic malformation, old term lymphangioma. This will be distinguishable usually because it'll be more infiltrative. It'll intercalate between the muscles of the tongue, but not always. Sometimes these try to fool you and occur as well-defined masses. The second is a dermoid cyst. Dermoid cysts occur in the midline up and down the neck, and the anterior tongue is one of the many places they occur. If you find fat, Inside the cyst, this is your good choice. Also, if it's perfectly spherical, that's most likely to be a dermoid. The third choice is the foregut duplication cyst, or choristoma. Um, and that rounds out the three entities that occur as anterior, midline, cystic, tongue masses. A worthwhile differential diagnosis. Don't forget about thyroglossal duct cysts. 
These don't belong on the differential diagnosis of anterior tongue mass because they aren't in the anterior tongue. Thyroglossal duct cysts, when they arise in the tongue, arise in the posterior tongue at the location of the foramen cecum. So you should really not be confusing that with the other three entities here. That concludes the lecture series on imaging of cystic neck masses.